Uh, my name is Craig Simons, Director of Marketing at Allego, Comprehensive Sales Enablement Platform. And when I learned about the opportunity to sponsor this event, uh, when I heard Josh was, was headlining, I was all over it. I've had the pleasure of following Josh's content for, for nearly two years, and he's easily, hands down, one of the best follows on LinkedIn and email subscriptions that, that you can subscribe to. I love learning about all the sales ninjas that he meets in his day-to-day -day life. Uh, and he always brings a different perspective to sales that is refreshing. It makes you think. And most importantly, it makes a positive impact on your results. And that's what Allego is about as well. Stick around to the very end of this webinar, and I'll explain in three minutes or less, I promise, three minutes or less, how Allego helps sales teams capture and share knowledge, just like the insights you're about to learn on today's webinar. So they don't just help you, but they spread across your entire team. And with that, Josh, uh, take it away. I'd like to start by asking you a question that I'd like you to respond to in the chat. And I don't want you to think about it. I just want you to respond. No thinking about it. Here's the scenario. Your job is to book meetings with prospects. You make a cold call. You get out the first five seconds of your opening line and the prospect says, can you send me an email? What do you say? Type it in the chat right now. Don't think about it. Just type it. Prospect says, can you send me an email? What do you say? And if somebody can just start to read out some of these responses, that would be amazing. Ooh, they're going fast and furious here. Let me see. Can uh, you give me 10 seconds to explain why I'm calling? All right. That was one I just saw. Yeah. It's going so fast. I can't read them. When do you want what to reschedule? Email? What kind of email would you be looking for? I'd rather call you back. I'm going to call you back. Okay. An email? So, question mark. <laughs> what would you want to see? <laughs> little 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 boss mirroring there. So this is interesting, right, guys? So this is um. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Are you guys seeing this? You seeing my screen? Yeah. So I I did this poll on LinkedIn a few months ago, and uh, 421 people responded. Salespeople asked the same same kind of question, right? And the responses fell into two buckets. Bucket number one is what I'm calling a persuading bucket, meaning the salesperson was trying to get the prospect to move forward in some way by taking a meeting. What that sounds like is this. Uh, it's better if we carve out some time to talk. They're trying to sort of push the thing forward. And the other bucket was not persuading, not trying to actually push the sale forward. So let me test your abilities in this area. I'm going to show you some responses that salespeople typed in. And I want you in the chat to type in if it's a persuading message or not persuading. So here's the first message that a salesperson typed in. Is that a persuasion message or not persuasion? What are people typing in the chat there? Not persuading, not persuading, not, not persuading, persuading, not, 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 not persuading, not persuading. Pretty good so mix. Persuading, persuading is when we're trying to get someone to do something. We're trying to talk them into something. So prospect says, can you send me an email? And this person says, let's set aside 15 minutes where we can discuss what you'd like me to include in your email. They're trying to book some time. So that would be an example of persuading. We're trying to get the prospect to do something. So that would be persuading. What about this one? Persuading or not persuading? So what people type in the chat when they read this one. Persuading, persuading. Oh, people are getting the hang of it. Persuading. What's the tell? How do you how do you know this is in the chat? How do you know this is persuading? What's the tell? What what's the phraseology that this person is using that's tipping the prospect off that they're trying to talk them into something? Asking them to set time aside. Let's set up yes. some time. Let's set up some time is the tell. Okay, so what about this one? Persuading or not persuading? Waiting. Persuading, 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 yeah. persuading, persuading, not persuading, yeah. persuading, persuading, pers persuading. Interesting. What is that? What's the tell on this one, everybody? Can someone type in it? What's like, what's the tip off that this person is trying to talk the prospect into something? They're trying to overcome minute, the objection. 10 yeah, minute phone ask. call with tomorrow at noon, with tomorrow, time and appointment, asking for something. Yeah. Yes. You got it. You got it. What about this one from Sarah Brazier over at Gong? This one's a little different. Not, 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 not. What is different? Not. What is different about what is different about this one compared to the other ones? Let's see no if anyone ask. gets this. I'm looking for a specific idea here. And if someone gets it, 
I'm going to give them a free version of my tongue tied flash objection flashcards. Giving them power, asking for permission. Who said that? Who said giving them power? Who said giving them power? Uh, Let me scroll up. Giving them power was Catherine Roman. All right, Catherine, send me an email, josh at joshbron.com. I'm going to give you a free set of my tongue-tied flash objection flashcards. You're exactly right. Well, we're, this is different because we're giving control to the prospect. We're letting them choose. And when you let people choose, you lower resistance. When you tell people what to do and you assume they want to meet, you create sales pressure. So that's not persuading. If you had to take a guess as to what percentage of salespeople tried to persuade versus not persuade, meaning how many people answered like Sarah Brazier versus everyone else, how do you think that percentage would break out? 95, 95, 85, 90, 85, 15, 80, 80, 89, 97, 50, 50. Why is that everybody? Type it into the chat. Why, Why are most salespeople trying to push the sale forward? Control, common thread, training, desperation, pressure, commission. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Commission. The the problem is as sellers, we are paid to get people to move from point A to point B as fast as possible. Um, And from an outbound perspective, it kind of looks like this. And the problem is when we move faster then the prospect is ready to move, they enter what I call the zone of resistance. I'll actually prove it to you. Imagine for a second that you're in the mall and a kiosk person locks eyes with you and says, here, uh, take this free sample. Or can I ask you a question? You probably look away, pick up the pace, pretend you're getting a phone call because you know if you engage, you're going to get some sea scrub rubbed on you and get sold something that you don't want. It's called the zone of resistance. It's a reflex reaction to sales pressure. The other day, I went into Hugo Boss. The sales associate said, what brings you in today? And I said, nothing. I'm just looking. But that's a lie. I didn't just wake up one day and decide to drive across town, park in a crowded parking lot from Thanksgiving and walk into Hugo Boss. I went there with intent to get something. But I told the salesperson I was just looking because I didn't want the pressure of them throwing something over my dressing room drawer, trying to sell me some pants or a shirt. And your prospects feel like this all the time. We're taught how to persuade, and yet it's the persuasion that creates the resistance. There's a time for persuasion, of course, but it is not when we are first reaching out to prospects. The cause of this are books like this, which I've read and I'm sure you've read. They're sort of the Bible for salespeople. And because we are taught how to persuade, it's our only gear. We lead with it. We learn how to talk people into things. We don't take no for an answer, and it backfires. Here's what persuading sounds like. These are actual call transcripts. Prospect picks up the phone. Salesperson says this. I believe we've discovered a breakthrough in unleashing the power of frontline employees. Of course you think it's a breakthrough. You're the one selling it. And what the hell is an innovation power for frontline employees anyway? The reason I reached out to you is to get 15 minutes on your calendar. Of course you want 15 minutes on my calendar you want a sale, you have a vested interest. Or questions like this. If I could 10x your revenue, would you be interested? These are leading questions. It's like saying, if I told you something that was interesting, would you be interested? <laughs> it, when prospects sense that you're asking them a question that's in your best interest, you create resistance because the prospect knows that you're putting your best interest first. And yet, That's what we're trained to do, to talk people into things. Your price is too high. The old feel, felt, found thing, right? I understand how you feel. Most people felt the same way. But what they found was the ROI of our solution was a no-brainer. Never in the history of viewing and listening to calls have I ever heard a prospect say, you know what? You're right. Your price isn't too high. Where do I sign? It just doesn't work. The more you push, the more people pull away. Of course, you think it's a no-brainer. You're selling it. You're biased. We have a vendor for that. Oh, that's okay. I understand. Many customers were using another vendor when I reached out, but what they found was our solution provided additional value. What does that even mean, additional value? When do you want to meet? Three or four. Again, taking control away creates pressure. It's assumptive. When you're assumptive, you create pressure. Send me an email. 
The email comes with me. I just want to, there's a towel, right? I just want to, I call it a case of the, I just want us. Of course you just want to, you want to sell. How's Tuesday at two? When your intent is to talk everyone into buying by persuading, what ends up happening is because that's your intent going in, that you're taught to talk everyone into buying, you say things and behave in ways that feel salesy, manipulative, and gross. And therefore you get the same results. And more importantly, you have the same debilitating feeling of rejection when prospects turn you down because you're attaching your self-worth to the outcome. So what I want to suggest to you in this workshop is how to prevent objections from even happening, most of them anyway, by changing one thing. And that is this, to stop persuading and instead to learn how to lower the zone of resistance. Because without lowering the zone of resistance, you're never going to have a chance to persuade anyone. Not with the intent of getting a meeting, because you don't control if you get a meeting. You don't control the weather. You don't control your quota. You don't control airline delays. Focusing on things you don't control is a recipe for being upset and pissed off all the time. You're just going to tune out what you don't control, and you're going to tune in what you do control. We're going to lower the zone of resistance just so we can get to this thing, the truth. And the truth is going to be one of two things. Yes, the prospect would like to continue the conversation or no, they don't at this time. When your intent is to let go of assumptions and to let go of expectations, of course, you have a hypothesis, but you don't know if your hypothesis is actually true until you have a conversation. When that's your intent going in, you actually sound completely different on the phone because you're not trying to push someone forward. You're going to ask a question that's going to point out a potential problem your prospect has and see if they lean forward. Because of that, you're going to get different results because prospects aren't going to feel the push. You're going to come at this from a neutral perspective of discovering versus persuading. We're going to get into some examples. And most importantly, you're no longer going to have the debilitating feeling of rejection because you're not for everyone. There could be any number of reasons why your hypothesis was wrong. Last week, I did a scenario with some salespeople and we were mock cold calling, selling grass-fed beef to the door. And I was the prospect and I said, oh, I don't eat meat. I've been a vegan for 30 years and I don't believe in killing animals. And the salesperson thought it was his job to overcome that objection. That's not an objection. That's the truth. I guess you could spend some time converting a 30-year-old vegan into a meat eater, but it's probably a better idea to find meat eaters. Lots of meat eaters out there. So this is what I have been taped to my wall since I was in my 30s. Um, It's my mantra, how I set my intention when I make cold calls. My job is to shine a light or illuminate a problem. So prospects can determine if they would like to continue the conversation. Some will and some won't. My role is to merely listen without having expectations. So how do you do that? Okay. This is going to be a little tricky. So be patient if you stumble with this one. But it's the first step in lowering the zone of resistance. I'm going to share with you two stories. They're both quick. Take about a minute and a half each to tell. They both have something in common. The person that gets this right, I'm going to send them a free set of my sales objection flashcards. Uh, And we'll have uh, identify that right now. So here's the first story. When I turned 50, I wanted one of these. I'm a cyclist. This is a Pinarella Dogma F12 in Venetian blue. It is an absurdly priced bike, but I'm a cyclist and I wanted it. Called some bike shops. The first two said they had some bikes in stock and to come on over. And they also had some accessories that they were promoting with the bike. Called the third bike shop, Racer's Edge in Boca Raton. John, who's the owner, picks up. I say, hey, John, I'm looking for a Pinarella Dogma F12 in Venetian blue, size 50 or 51. And I'll never forget what John said. He said, we don't sell bikes that way. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, the problem is when you buy a Pinarello, you'll ride it around the parking lot. It'll feel great. But then you'll take it on a long 50 or 60 mile ride. Won't feel so great. Back might hurt. Knees might hurt because it might not fit you right. And oftentimes these bikes can't be adjusted to fit you. 
So you end up having to sell them for a 30% loss. I said, well, what do you guys do? He goes, well, we fit you first. It's a three-hour process. I've done it over 5,000 times. And once we fit you on a bike during this process, we, we actually, once we fit you, then we match you to a bike. I came in, did the three-hour fitting, and John matched me to this bike, which was actually more than the Pinarello. This is a specialized S-Works SR7 in snake eye green. There's John doing the final adjustments on the bike. And John sold me this bike. That's story number one. What does that have in common with story number two? Here's story number two. Several years ago, I'm in the mall with my wife. I don't need anything. I was going to grab some dinner with her after she was done shopping at True Food Kitchen. To kill some time, I walked into a fit-to-run store. I didn't need anything. So if the store associate said, what brings you in today? I would have said nothing. If she said, can I help you? I would have said, I'm good. If she said, we got these new Brooks sneakers. They've got these great carbon soles. I'm like, you know what? I'm good. I have a vendor for that. I got sneakers for that already. But she didn't do any of those things. She looked down at my sneakers. She said, are you a runner? I said, yes. She said, what distance? I said, I'm training for my first marathon. And then she said, have you ever had a gait analysis test? And I said, what the heck is that? Moments later, I'm on a treadmill in the Fit to Run store. She's videotaping it. She freezes the frame, zooms in on my ankles. And she says this, notice how your ankles are over pronating when you run. I'm like, yeah, so what? What's the big deal? She goes, well, the problem is if you run in sneakers that are not made for pronated feet, you can get plantar fasciitis, shin splints, and you can get sidelined from your race. If you'd like, I could take a look at your sneakers to see if they're made for pronated feet. And about seven minutes later, I'm spending 180 fucking dollars on new sneakers and insoles. So the question is in the chat, what do those two stories have in common? Craig? Got a lot of responses. Yeah, understanding your specific... Uh, needs or problems first, custom fit to your problem and build credibility, ask questions, break the cycle of sales pressure, shine a light on a problem you didn't know you had. Who said yes. that? Who said that right there? Who said that? That was one? Riley Blaisdell. Riley, Josh at joshbron.com. You are the winner. So say that, read Riley's again. Shine the light on a problem you didn't know you have by asking something yes. that you were not used to hearing or being asked. That's right. So Riley, Josh at joshbron.com. That's exactly it. The superpower, the first thing you have to have is you have to know something that your prospect doesn't know that can hurt them. If they continue running in their current sneakers, what terrible, no good, very bad thing happens? And it can't just be a minor inconvenience. If I was only running a 2K race, it wouldn't have mattered. Problems alone aren't enough to inspire people to take action. They got to be big. I live with problems all the time. I got a pixel out of my TV in the back bedroom right now. It's a problem, but I rarely watch that TV. And when I do, I barely notice the pixel. So we have to have a perspective. It's about illuminating problems. So to burn this in, to test your knowledge on this, we're going to see if you can identify in the chat whether this message is a problem-based message or a product-based message. Product makes messages. Talk about what the product is. Problems are focused on a terrible thing that happens if you do nothing. So here's the first example. If anyone knows what a Yeti mug is, here's the message. Is this focused on a pro- on the product or is it focused on a problem? Let's see in the chat. Product. Everybody. Pretty anonymous. Yeah, and the tell is it's explaining what it is. The thing is, I don't really care about what something is. That doesn't affect my life at all. How would we make this into a problem message? Let's see if anyone nails this in the chat. Keeps water cold what for pro- three days. Mm. You like cold drinks? Can uh, let's see. It's moving so quickly. My coffee gets cold. Yes, you guys it's got it. From, that's that's yeah. that's exactly it. It, it. it you your hot things don't stay hot. Your cold things don't stay cold. That's exactly it. Let's get a little harder one. So, DUI legal representation. Is that focused on a problem or in this case, a service? Service, 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 problem, Ooh, good, service, good. service, service, service. Someone, service. Thought a pro- someone thought a problem. One problem. It's not, yeah. this is not a, this is, uh, this is, what do you think, uh, Craig? You think this is a problem or you think this is a description of a service? Yeah, I think it's a service description. Why? Well, the, this doesn't really mention my problem at all. Right. What's the problem this solves? D- getting DUI representation solves what problem? <laughs> that I stay out of jail. Yes. 
That's exactly it, right? So it's don't spend the night in jail, right? So brains pay attention to problems. That's why the nightly news always leads with problems, right? They'll, there's something wrong with your peas. News at 11, you're like, shit, I'm eating peas. What's wrong with my peas? I better tune in, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there's this two millimeter shift is what I'm suggesting here when we make our calls and our talk tracks is to stop persuading and start asking questions, but not just any questions. Questions that are going to shine a light on a problem in a way without leading people to a desired answer. In other words, neutral questions. Let's actually give you some examples here. Start off real simple. If I were to say to Craig, Craig, vanilla is the best ice cream flavor. Assuming that Craig doesn't think that's true, which maybe he does. Actually, Craig, uh, I think vanilla is the best ice cream flavor, don't you? I don't. No. No. See, it's going to be very easy for him to disagree. What do you like? What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Generally, cookies and cream. I've been on a bit of a cookie dough um, tear lately. <laughs> so notice when I make a statement, it's very easy for someone to raise an objection. But when I ask a question, something really interesting happens. Your brain has to focus on answering it. So if I were to say to you, what color is your car? You're automatically going to be thinking of the color in your car. It's kind of like I've hijacked your brain a little bit, right? So if I ask Craig, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? It's going to be hard for him to say, no, it's not ice. Cream. I don't like vanilla because I'm not making a statement. I'm asking a question, right? Let's get a little harder. So in the sneaker example that I shared earlier, the traditional sales approach is we have the number one rated insole used by 5,000. Good for you that you're number one. Congratulations. How does that affect my life? If we turn that into a problem-based statement on a cold call, it simply might sound like this. So Josh, we are seeing that marathon runners between the ages of 43 and 70, gee, that's me, I'm 53. They're at the highest risk for plantar fasciitis. If you don't mind me asking, how are you reducing the risk of plantar fasciitis today? And then do the hardest thing, shut the front door, don't say anything. Now, let me explain to you the phraseology here. We're leading with something that we know about marathon runners to be definitively true, unbiased information. We're seeing that marathon runners between the ages of 43 and 70. And then look at this phraseology, if you don't mind me asking, why do you think I'm suggesting that you use that phrase? It gets back to what we said earlier in the workshop. Why this phrase, if you don't mind me asking? What is that doing? Anybody in the chat? Power to the prospect, lower zone of resistance, gives them the feeling why of does control. It, why does it lower the, why does it, why does, yes. It gives them the ability and the control to decide if they want to answer the question or not. That's a key phrase I use all the time when I make cold calls and when I coach my clients. If you don't mind me asking, how are you reducing the risk today? It's very difficult for someone to say, I'm not interested when you're asking a question like that because you're not making a statement. They might say, well, I'm using X and Y and Z, and now we're in a conversation, right? See the shift here? Let's look at a couple other examples. So I'm working with a company called Mansfield Oil. These guys sell gasoline to major trucking companies like FedEx and UPS, people that drive a lot. And when we got there, they were sort of saying this, we are the largest independent supplier of fuel in North America. And everyone's like, whoop-de-whoop. Guess what? Everyone has fuel already. No matter what you sell, people are running in sneakers. No matter what you sell, people have fuel. Nobody's sitting around doing nothing. If they needed fuel, if they needed new sneakers, they'd be coming to you and all of your competitors. That's not outbound. So what we have to do is shift the message from a statement to a question that illuminates a problem with finesse in a neutral way where we're not leading anyone to a desired outcome. Here's what that might sound like. So we know that fuel makes up a third of a fleet's operating budget and is expected to continue being volatile in 2023. If you feel comfortable answering, how are you shielding against uncontrollable price swings today. Now, let's talk a little bit about tonality and pace. What I'm not doing is this. So fuel makes up a third of a fleet's operating budget and is expected to continue being volatile in 23. If you don't mind me asking, how are you shielding against uncontrollable prices today? Same words, but now I'm going to dial it back. And so sort of a matter of fact, 
not an expectation tonality. So John, uh, we're seeing that about a third of a fleet's operating budget is expected to continue being volatile in 2023, which as someone who's been doing this for 10 years, you probably already know. Um, if you don't mind me asking, how are you shielding against uncontrollable swings today? See how casual it is? The way you get casual sounding like I just did is you just memorize this first. You see a guitar back there. I, I can't learn the rhythm and I can't work on bringing the pacing of the guitar strings up higher or lower or the volume up or down until I know the notes. So once I get this under my tongue, then I can start to work on my tonality. And that's a great way to practice cold calling. Of course, you need to know the script, but you got to practice sounding casual when you deliver it. How you sound is almost equally as important as what you're saying. So the idea is to sound chill and relaxed. And when you detach from the outcome and you're not assuming that they're not solving this in some way today, you're going to sound just much more relaxed and chill. And that's going to be much more inviting to prospects because you're not assuming anything. You just don't know how they're handling it today. They could be handling any number of ways. And then what you'll find most of the time when you say this is they'll tell you how they're handling it today. And now we're in a conversation. Another example. We're the number one rated email delivery platform. Okay, great. Good for you. Uh, so example for Warmbox. So Craig, in working with, I'm not sure about you guys. So notice that phrase. I just put this in there. I'm not sure about you guys. The phrase, I'm not sure about you guys. First off, it's casual. It's not so stiff. And second, it subconsciously says there's no assumptions here, which lowers the zone of resistance. Hey, I'm not sure about you guys, but we've been working with over 2K, 2,000 inside sales teams. And what we're seeing over here, notice I'm kind of making it loose, is that 51% of the cold emails that are sent from tools like Sales Loft and Outreach um, end up in spam. Um, if you don't mind me asking, how are you ensuring cold emails don't land in spam folders today? And then just do the hardest thing, shut your mouth and just let your prospect talk. What we're doing here is we're not persuading anybody. We're trying to figure out how people are running today. How are they getting the job done today? Everybody's making progress, right? So how do you get this language? How do you get this problem-based language? Here's how not to get it. And I have, and I have all the love in the world for marketing. Um, but you can't get this language from marketing because what it ends up sounding like is this. We help people streamline and optimize their business performance metrics across a wide variety of platforms. It just sounds very stiff. What we want to sound like is if we're talking to someone over coffee. We want to actually use the words of the customer. So how do you find them? You look for things that are in between quotes. So here's a company, it's called Captivate IQ. And the problem they solve is this. Imagine you got 150 reps. They all started at different times and they all got different comp plans that are changing all the time. And you got to keep track of all those calculations. And salespeople are knocking on your door all the time wanting to know how much money they're going to make this quarter. It's error prone and it's so time consuming. So Captivate IQ solves that problem. But I don't care about the solution because solutions have no value without a problem. I have to illuminate a problem. So this is what I did. I went on the Captivate IQ website. I went to customer success stories. And I looked for language coming out of my ICP in quotes, meaning it's coming out of the voice of a customer. So here's what Albert Wong said. And, and Craig had a great suggestion earlier. You can look at G2 on this as well. G2 is another great source for this. How are, how are people describing the thing that sucked before they switched? And extra bonus points if they use a word like nightmare. Why? Because that's what I call emotionally charged language. It's got energy behind it. And if you can make people feel something, you're golden. The idea here is to sound like a customer. So we're going to take this language that you see on the screen, and we're merely going to post it into our framework. So let me show you what that looks like. So I'm not sure about your process, Craig, over there. And again, that phrase subconsciously says 
to the prospect. There's no assumptions here. There's no expectations here. And it just lowers the zone of resistance. It's just like taking a deep breath. So, hey, I'm not sure about your process over there, Craig. And I just added that, right, casually over there, kind of improvising. Not sure about your process over there, Craig, but uh, typically uh, determining payouts tends to involve a lot of manual data entry in spreadsheets and customizing reports for individual reps. Where did I get that from? From the voice of the customer. They're better at writing this stuff than you are. And then I'm going to ask a question. If you don't mind me asking, how, how does that compare to your experience? And then just shut your mouth. I love the question, how does that compare to your experience? I was just listening to a call from Captivate IQ not too long ago when the rep did exactly this. And the prospect right out of her mouth said, that is exactly how it is over here. Why did she say that? Because another customer said it, that's like her. She goes, and on top of that, I have to also approve all the stuff that finance has. And it's, it's this whole sort of back and forth dance. I'm like, that's gold, right? That we could add. It allows a lot of data entry, that uh, manual data entry. And there's this sort of back and forth dance for approvals, right? There's this sort of back, listen to this phrase. There's this sort of back and forth dance for approvals. See how casual that is? What I'm suggesting here is we got to sound casual, loose. Not sure about how you guys are doing this. I actually kind of like that better than what's your process. Process sounds a little formal. I'm not sure about how you guys are doing this, but typically I hear determining payouts involves a ton of like manual data entry and work in spreadsheets. And there's a sort of back and forth dance approvals. You know, finance sends it to you. You have to approve it, send it back. How does that compare to your experience? And then just- Josh, we got a live question. What if they reply flatly? Nope, we're not experiencing that problem. Fantastic. Then I say this. Wow, I rarely hear that. What's your secret? Now, this gets back to my initial. I'm so glad. Who brought this question up? I love this question. That was uh, Jeremy Patterson. The reason I love this question is because it's not your job to talk people into your solution that don't have a problem. It's not your job to talk vegans into eating meat. If there is no problem, we're simply going to go to the next person. It's not your job to create problems that don't exist. This is a real tough pill for uh, salespeople to swallow. But I equate it to you're sort of like on a beach uh, with a metal detector. Sure, you go to the right beach at the right time. But you're not digging everywhere. You're going to dig where there's a beep, where there's a pulse. If the person doesn't have the problem for any number of reasons, maybe in this case, they have a small amount of sales reps or they just, hire, they just bought another product. No problem, no need for a new product. So again, this gets back to the idea of letting go of thinking that it's your job to talk people into what you're selling. Your job is to see if someone lights up when you illuminate a problem. Some will and some won't. You simply go on to the next person. You don't try to talk vegans into buying meat. There are a lot of people out there that have this problem. Go find them. When you do this really well, it's not that it's not difficult because what happens is people just open up and they start talking about it. Not everyone, of course, but some people. And yeah, the there's a bunch of follow-up questions now. And, yeah. and, and I think I know what you might say to some of these that, well, if they think they've got it all figured out and then they, they tell you, and then you say something like, um, well, it sounds like you got a perfect process in place. And then they say, well, it's not perfect. And then you're having a conversation and actually talking about their real problems. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, they, they, you can say them. Um, sounds like this is one of the phrases that I use a lot. And I think this is what the the Captivate IQ rep did. Um, He said, sounds like your process is blissfully simple and easy. And she started cracking up. Well, I wouldn't say it's blissfully simple and easy. So Chris Voss calls this labeling. And what's interesting about this technique is that people love correcting you, but they don't like being corrected. So sounds like it's perfect. 
sounds like it's checking all the boxes, right? But if we're not able to shine a light on a problem, then there's no need to really talk about any kind of solution. You might have to hone this message in a little bit or figure out who your ICP is. One of the big mistakes that I see a lot of orgs making, and maybe this kind of gets uh, to something we chatted about earlier, Craig, is I see a lot of people combining lots of prospects into the same list. So they'll have a CFO, a marketing director, a manager, all different different jobs into one list. And they're calling all those people down at, at the same list. Well, all those people care about different things. So the talk track is going to be different based on who you're calling. You got to segment the list. A chief financial officer doesn't care about how beautiful the color is in the printer and how fast it prints. He or she cares about the cost per page. A marketing director cares about how quickly it prints and the colors of the print, right? So we got to segment our lists by job to be done. And then we can kind of have a hypothesis as to what the problem is with their current way of doing something. And then we ask a question with finesse. So this is now it's your turn to do this. Um, I want you guys to flex your muscle a little bit. These are a couple of templates, frameworks. And what I want you to do, and we'll go through some uh, feedback in this workshop. Craig and I will provide you with some feedback, is I want you to, for your product or service that you sell, I want you to use this framework to shine a light on a potential problem your prospect might not be aware of so that you can understand how they're currently getting the job done today. Not as a mechanism to get the sale, but as a way to create an opening. And the more openings you create, ultimately the more money you end up making. So let's give people a little time here. And if you have questions about this exercise, uh, let Craig or I know, we'll try to help guide you through it. But I want you guys to practice this in the chat. Like, you know, get your reps in here with this coaching opportunity from Craig and I. Um, use one of these templates or modify it, you know, for one that you like. like Make sure that the question is neutral. You're not saying, if I could 10x your revenue, would you want to talk to us? And Craig, if you got any of these coming through, we'll, we'll, we will try to critique them. Yeah, I got, I got two so far. All right, let's hear the first one. I'm not sure about you, but we've, we've been working with over 2,600 process manufacturers and found that over 60% of them were reviewing data that was still being manually entered day to day and are overpaying by 10x in waste and labor costs by being reactive rather than proactive. If you don't mind me asking, how does that compare to your experience? Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Um, what I would suggest on that is I would um, suggest maybe making that a little bit shorter. Um, and maybe instead of how does this compare to your experience, how are you currently going about doing that, dealing with that today? That's the, you got the idea there. Who was who that, that that chimed in on that one? Who was that? That one was uh, Joshua Beckwith. That's a really that's really good, Josh. Let me see if I can go in the chat and see like what that looks like. I can't on my screen see that. That's a really, read that one one more time. That was a good one. I'm not sure about you, but we've been working with over 2,600 process manufacturers and found that over 60% of them were reviewing data that's still being manually entered day to day, and are overpaying by over 10x in waste and labor costs by being reactive rather than proactive. You okay, don't that, mind me that, asking. We can cut. We can we can cut that last part out by being reactive rather than being proactive, right? And instead of saying 10X or whatever that was, I would like you to use a more specific like number, like they're overpaying typically by, you know, eight to 9%. You know, they're, they're, so we know that they're, you know, typically they're overpaying by 15 to 18%. Uh, curious, how are you been dealing with um, overpaying today? How are, you, how are you dealing with that today? That's the idea. Let's do another one. Uh, that's, that, was a, that was a good one. Yeah, there's, there's like about 10 of them now. I'm just going to pick one random. Okay. I'm not sure about you folks, but no decision outcomes are usually the biggest competitor SaaS organizations face. Poor value articulation is the leading cause of no decision outcomes. How does that compare to your experience? Read it one more time. I'm not sure about you folks, but no decision outcomes are usually the biggest competitor SaaS organizations face. Poor value articulation is the leading cause of no decision outcomes. How does that compare to your experience? Okay, so poor, so poor va- that phrase, read that poor value. What does it say? Poor value what? Poor, poor value values. articulation. So I don't like that phrase. It doesn't really, um, it sounds very generic. I kind of like the idea with this. Hey, we know that the number one cause of losing deals is no decision. 
How are you going about mitigating that risk today? Something like that. Right. That's the, that you kind of got the idea of it. That's, that's, that's a good one. Let's do another one. Our developers spend 5x more time implementing a company into our retail client's tech stack than, uh, sorry, when they do not have a pre-built integration to the commerce platform used by the client. How are you reducing the implementation effort for retail clients? I like this one a lot. The thing I don't like is anytime we're saying 5x or 10x or 8x because it's so generic. So if you can turn that into a, some kind of a percentage, uh, we know that they're spending at least 30 to 40% of their time doing something, you know, something, something like that that's a little bit more specific. Round numbers and 10xing things don't hit as much because they sound made up. Uh, so, you know, we know that people are overpaying eight to 10% or they're spending at least 30 to 40% of their, of their time doing X, Y, and Z is going to be much better than 10 Xing things because everyone says 10 Xing things. I think Crank Cardone says it the most, if I'm not mistaken, but that's going to just sort of drown you out because it's, it's too common. So be a little more specific with the numbers if possible. Let's do a, let's do a couple more, Craig. All right. Working with clinics in the area, they're seeing delayed documentation costs thousands of dollars a year. If you don't mind me asking, how are you ensuring physicians are finishing documentation within 24 hours of the appointment? Yeah, that's a good one. And if they don't finish documentation within 24 hours, what ends up ha happening? Right? So you might want to append that by saying, so that terrible thing doesn't happen. That's a really good one. Really good. So got some good, good ones here. Okay. Um, you still may bump into some objections. Uh, it's going to be far, far, far fewer, which is why I wanted to spend most of the time talking about how to pre prevent these objections from happening by framing your calls differently. And you guys did a great job in the chat of working out this muscle. But like anything, you can't get better at something that you haven't been taught and you haven't been practicing. So you've been taught something and you're practicing it, taken out in the wild. Let's talk about objections for a second. Um, what I want to do for a second is I want to share with you a clip. I'm going to share the sound on this one. Um, this is a little bit disturbing. <laughs> I'm going to play it in for you anyway. This is a, um, a Comcast customer trying to cancel their service and a retention specialist that's trying to overcome their objections. And what I want you to put in the chat is why Ryan, who's the customer, is getting so frustrated by the salesperson who's trying to overcome objections. Here's the clip. We'd like to, we'd like to disconnect. We'd like to disconnect, please. Okay, so why is it that you don't want the faster speed? Help me understand why you don't want faster internet. Help me understand why you can't just disconnect us. Because my job is to, ha is to have a conversation with you about having, about this, I mean, keeping your service, about finding out why it is that you're looking to cancel the service. I mean, being that we are the number one provider of internet and TV service in the entire country, okay, why is it that you're not wanting to have the number one rated internet service, number one rated TV service available? I'm declining to state we're switching providers. Can you please go to the next question? Okay. So what is it about a town that's making you want to change to them? All right. So I have to stop that because it's so cringe. <laughs> it makes me embarrassed about our profession, honestly. It's also made me almost quit the job of my profession many times. Every time I hear it, I'm like, what am I doing? So, like, so what is it? What was, why was Ryan so frustrated? What was this? What's your guys' take in the chat? What are people typing in there? Finger pointing. Had to hit quota. Yeah. He wasn't, oh, he yeah. wasn't being heard. His tone. Yes. Not listening. Yes. Yes. We think it's our job to overcome objections, but the thing that you have to understand about objections is they carry one of two meanings. They're either true or they're not true. Ryan was telling the truth because truths have oomph. He was giving reasons why he wanted to cancel. When you treat a truth like an objection, you piss people off. If someone were to say to you, I can't talk right now, that's no oomph. They might be brushing you off. But if someone says, I can't talk to you right now because I'm on my way to the hospital, and you say, can I steal 37 seconds to tell you why I called? You're going to piss them off. So when a prospect gives you a reason, that's probably a truth. And we want to treat that very differently than a brush off. Send me some information, probably a brush off. We've got to dig into that a little bit more. Call me next quarter, probably a brush off because there's no reason or oomph behind it. Send me a proposal, probably a brush off. I can't tell you how many people 
send proposals when prospects ask them for proposals. Instead, you say this. Sounds like if the proposal has what you want for the price we discussed, you're ready to move forward next week. And then listen to all the real objections that have nothing to do with the proposal. So what's the way out here? Again, detaching from the outcome. Instead of overcoming objections, simply understand them. So if you remember from the beginning of the workshop, Prospect says, send me an email. Listen to how Ryan Reisert uses the approach to understand and to give control back to the prospect to open up a seven-minute call. Here's Ryan. Hello. Hey, is this Norman? Yeah. Hey, Norman, this is Ryan Reisert calling with uh, phone burner. If I caught you at a bad time. Hi, yeah, uh, uh, can you just email me at norman at dot work? Thanks. Yeah, that's not a problem. Uh, Norman, do you mind if I just share why I was reaching out and see if it's even worth that email? Yeah, yeah. Cool. And that opens up a seven minute call, right? Simply by not trying to persuade or push. Say, hey, that, that's, look how Ryan just paused for a second for two beats. And I love his phrase that he used. Uh, that's not a problem. Prospects are not expecting that. <laughs> Uh, would it make sense for me to share why I'm calling to see if an email even makes sense? Not assuming that you're even interested. Does this work all the time? Nothing works all the time. But it does reduce your risk of failure and opens up way more conversations. I'm not interested. Right? Pause for two beats. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. That's okay. <laughs> I'm moving with the resistance, not fighting resistance. I know you didn't ask me to call you. Hey, before we hang up, if you don't mind me asking, is it because my timing is off or is this completely irrelevant? Now, listen to my tonality here. Uh, I'm not interested. Uh, that's okay. I know you didn't ask me to uh, call you. Probably crazy busy. Hey, hey be before we hang up, if you don't mind me asking, if I'm not asking too much, uh, is it because my timing is off or is this just completely irrelevant? in a calm voice. Now notice the phrase, hey, before we hang up. I learned this from a hostage negotiator that wasn't Chris Voss, but I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now. He's called this an artificial time constraint. Prospect knows the call's about to be over. It's like when you run into someone in a restaurant and you say, I can only stay for a minute, right? How'd you get my number? You might be inclined to say something like, I got it off the internet when that's not true. You got it from Zoom Info. Never lie. Prospect can call your bluff. Just be honest with people. I got your contact info from Zoom Info. Seems like I have a couple numbers here. Um, it's a service that they give us as salespeople that gives us access to, to contact information. And now watch this magic phrase. Chris Foss calls this labeling. It sounds like it's inappropriate for me to be calling you on this number. Now listen to the tonality here. Chris Foss calls this a late night DJ FM voice, which I love that phrase, right? It, it sounds like it's inappropriate for me to be calling you on this number. I'm so sorry. What you're going to hear when you do this most of the time is a prospect's going to say, well, that's okay, man. What, what, what do you need? The big takeaway here is to stop persuading and to start understanding. What I'd like to do, oh, there's one more here. Send me some information. Sure, if you don't, uh, so I don't do you a disservice and send you irrelevant information, would it be okay if I ask you a few questions? And now we're into our conversation, right? So these are my sales objection flashcards, uh, joshbron.com slash shop. There's 34 of them. It comes with how to say it MP3s if you want to get a little bit better at this. I want to turn it over to Craig. I want to learn a little bit more about what you got over there, Craig. Yeah, thank, thanks, Josh. So I'm going to stay on the objections theme. Um, let's say you, you got a, a demo coming up. And, and right before the demo, you find out that um, there's another competitor in the deal. And you know that this is, this is going to come up on the demo, right? So what a Lego does is it offers a just-in-time content library so that you can pull out your phone. You know, Maybe it's a live in-person meeting. You're, you're in the parking lot. Or maybe you're about to jump on a Zoom. You pull it up on your computer. And you can you can quickly bring up the battle card, you know, for whatever product you're, you're selling, and, and look at where are your strengths, where's the competitors' weaknesses, and what questions can you ask 
that'll get them thinking about the competitors' weaknesses and your strengths, right? That are going to really highlight your differentiators. So that's just in time learning. That's that's um, pull. You're pulling that out of the, a content management platform uh, or a sales, an LMS or a sales learning platform. All right. And then you get into the demo and it goes great. And you're towards the end and a VP level person comes on and says, um, well, there's just a really high cost for us switching because of the complexities and with compliance. Um, and you restate the objection to make sure that you understood it. And you kind of give your boilerplate answer about how, you know, a lot of your customers, you know, have complex requirements with compliance and your customer success team is really, really well prepared to, to handle those, those issues. Um, and they seem appeased, but you, you also feel like you didn't answer their specific question. So the demo ends and then you get an alert, you know, from a Lego saying, hey, we identified an objection in your sale in, in the last demo. Um, here is a example of what great looks like from a top performer from last month handling this objection. And with one click, you're watching that top performer handle that objection on a live call. Um, and here's a one page PDF that you can share with the prospect that explains how we handle this specific uh, uh, compliance requirement. And in one click, you can share that to a personalized digital sales room. So this is an example of what a comprehensive enablement platform where your sales learning, your conversation intelligence, and your content management system are all truly integrated to make things really easy in the flow of a seller's job. And that's really what a Lego is all about. Can you do that with like my, my wife? I say something to my wife, it's bad, <laughs> and I get like an alert later and it's like, uh, yeah, that's, that, that would be good. Hey, we got about we got about that's that's interesting product. So we got about four or five minutes left. I don't know if anyone has any questions before we wrap up here. Um, someone wanted me to put this back on the screen, so I'll do that. I don't know, Craig, if we have any other questions before we wrap here. Yeah, there were a couple questions. Um, one you kind of hit on, but how do you decipher a truth from an objection? Right? I love this question. I love this yeah. question. I love this question. So this is the one that I do when I when I um when I train some people. So if someone says, I can't talk right now. There's no reason for that, right? There's no sort of oomph behind it. Versus if someone said, I can't talk right now because I'm on my way to the hospital. The phrase, because I'm on my way to the hospital has oomph, meaning there's a reason. And the reason is the truth, right? So if someone gives a reason, it's the truth. And what we don't want to do is overcome that. We don't want to treat that as an objection to overcome, right? So if someone says, hey, I can't talk right now, you call me, I'm at my kid's soccer game. Instead of saying, can I have 37 seconds to tell you why I called? You might say, I'll let you go real quick. What's the score? And they say, let's well, four, three, you hang up. And then you call back five days later and you say, did they pull out that win? Right? So you kind of play the long game a little bit here. Someone says. Here, let me let me test you on this, Craig. Someone says, I can't talk right now. I'm at the gym. Is that the truth or is that a brush off? Uh, it's probably true. It's very specific. They're at the, they're at the, they're at the, they're at the gym. Yeah. It's, yeah. At the gym. What, what, might, what might you say to just be like, oh, in the have, a, have a great workout, man. Is it leg day? What? Someone in the comments just threw that out yeah. there. Yeah. I love that. Like, ask a question. Is it leg day? You want a break? <laughs> back or buys, right? So, so Justin Michael, he's one of the great, great cold caller. I, I was listening to a call he did. I was a while back, and the prospect said, "I can't talk right now because I'm on a boat." And it was like Tuesday at like 11:30, and Justin said in a cool voice, "How do you get to be on a boat at 11:30 on a Tuesday?" And the prospect said, "You got to be old." And Justin said, "I'm 40." And the prospect said, "Well, you got to be older than that." And it just opened up the call. What Justin didn't do is say, can I have 37 seconds to tell you why I called? That's a very pressure-based intent to close. But when you lean back and you let go and you realize that that is the truth, when prospect says we have a vendor for that, that's not an objection. <laughs> that's the truth. Of course, people have a vendor. Nobody's sitting around not running in sneakers. So these are not objections. If you're hearing that too many times, it means that your message isn't meaningfully different than what they already have. You're basically selling sneakers to someone who has sneakers. Got to work on your poke the bear question. 
All right. I think, uh, I think that about wraps it up for us. Perfect. This is awesome. I know I learned lots, so I, I'm sure that the questions will keep coming in. Feel free to ask those questions in Sales Hacker, the discussion threads. I'm sure there'll be lots of folks in there answering and giving their opinions and thoughts on that. Um, but thank you, Josh and Craig, for joining us today and sharing your time with the community. It is always a joy to work with you both. So I am looking forward to next time.